Okay, so this is what we cover on the skeleton. Notice that it is even a fairly big outline. Um, hopefully some of the slides will give you kind of a, a checklist of the sort of things that you need to be able to identify. Um, but we're essentially going to go through the whole skeleton, um, break it up into several bigger pieces. That's the axial skeleton and the appendicular. Uh, talk about how to classify bones, then uh, ultimately, uh, this is not in the correct order by the way, we'll talk about the, the bone tissue morphology uh, finally, um, but before that we'll talk about the types of joints. And if you guys look desperately asleep, I'm going to take the most extroverted of you and pitch you against each other before I talk about that section. So let me know if you guys are interested in playing a game. <laughs> Nervous laughter, okay. Um, and then there's one other point actually here at the beginning that I always forget we're going to talk about, but what makes it a chordate? Though we talked about that a little bit during development. Um, which I guess we might as well cover here because I don't think there's a separate slide for it. Um, so if you're a chordate, you're not necessarily a vertebrate. Um, you need a few things. You need a tail that comes after your butt. You need a notochord, which is that kind of organizing piece of mesoderm that runs the whole length of the body. Um, in some of us, uh, in us, the higher quote-unquote higher chordates, the notochord actually dissolves um, and becomes the inner ver vertebral discs. Um, but if you're somebody lower, like an amphioxus, it actually serves as the major source of support for you throughout the entire life of it. And it can kind of get pasted over with some kind of cartilaginous um, tissue to, to lend that support. Um, the other we already talked about, uh, the pharyngeal gill slits, as they're in the PowerPoint slide, which I will remind you is incorrect. They are never gills in a human or a turtle or even a duck. Um, they're only gill slits when you're a fish. However, that set of tissues is derived from the neural crest, which is one of the major innovations of the chordates. Um, and in fish, it will give you gills. In us, it will give you... Uh, it will give you the, the, the lower pieces of, uh, your, uh, of your head. Uh, mostly the mesodermal components, say like the mandible, uh, the bone that disconnects and helps support uh, trachea and other stuff, the, the thyroid, uh, hyoid and so forth. Anyway, if it's down here in your throat, it's probably a result of that. But it is not a gill slit, it is a pharyngeal arch. Um, and if I forgot one, then it's on the front page. Okay, so I like this slide because it's a nice, neat little summary of about the level of detail that you need to know that you're responsible for um, to identify for this class. Uh, it only lets you down a little bit um, when you're talking about uh, the different bones that are in the skull. So we'll actually have you identify the different pieces that are fused together. But we also have several slides to cover that that will highlight that importance. Everything else is very appropriate. There's a, the long bones are fairly easy to recognize for their importance. Um, the different bones in the hands, um, from the phalanges, your fingers, the metacarpals, your palms, the carpals to your wrist, um, and the relevant uh, orthologous structures in the foot being tarsals, metatarsals, um, then, honestly, like I said, if it's labeled, it's important, um, including the differences between the different vertebrae. But again, we'll talk about that in a different slide. Uh, so let's bust up the, sy the skeletal system a little bit. So there's two major divisions. There's axial and appendicular. Listen to the name of the words to let you know what they are. Axial is part of your axis. That means the central line of your body. So this is going to include the skull, neck, backbone, uh, and the ribs. Essentially, if you're a fish, you have this, and you have a relevant uh, 
an orthologous structure, it's the axial skeleton. If you're a terrestrial animal, then you're going to have these appendicular structures. So fish don't necessarily have arms, especially not in this form. They definitely don't have legs, especially in this form. Uh, but they do, however, have these vertebrae. They do have a rib cage, essentially, uh, with their with their different um, series of bones. Um, they do have a head, and they do have a tail, which in us is this fused little bit at the bottom called the sacrum, right? Uh, in contrast, we have the appendicular skeleton on the next slide, or we would if we had the right slide. Um, but that's basically anything that's um, an arm or attaching the arm. Uh, one thing I, I'd like to point out, um, if you look at uh, seagoing mammals, the whales, the dolphins, and so forth, it's always interesting to look at how hypomorphic a lot of these app, uh, a lot of the appendicular skeleton is. They almost all lose uh, essentially their whole pelvic girdle until it's just this little vestige right there below the rib cage. And I don't know, if you're an Evo buff like me, that's it. Um, like I said, you do want to know the, the bigger pieces of the skull as well. Uh, don't pay attention to the labeled sutures on here, but do pay attention if it's a big piece. Um, you should know the name for it. Um, and try to use, try to take the words apart to have them tell you where it's at. The frontal bone is in the front. That's not a big surprise. The nasal bone has to do with your nose. That's that. Uh, zygomatic, I can't help you. Uh, maxilla mandible, you might have from previous um, studies that might sound intuitive to you anyway. But the other one, um, if I was thinking about an isolation, temporal would be... Um, it wouldn't mean much to me, but you think about your temples. Okay, so think about these things um, in terms of what they, what the words themselves say, and you'll be fine. Um, remember, remember, Ali told us why we're calling this occipital at the back. There's the front view. There's also a bottom view. Uh, there's one other one that I have an intuitive or an experiential way of explaining. Um, back when I was a chemistry major, we dealt with a lot of stuff that were lacrimating agents, which they tell us makes you cry. And so the lacrimal bone is up here next to the um, up ne next to the tear ducts there. Anyway, that one makes sense to me. Find things that make sense. And here it is from the underside. Um, and we're not going to get you on all the canals, but you should make a note when you're exploring that these are the various places that the different cranial nerves plug into the brain. Um, if you think about it, the eye really is kind of an external structure. It's on the outside of your skull. So are your ears. Um, so are the things that are running down to innervate the heart and so forth. Um, so if it's a cranial nerve, it probably has a hole. Um, this big one here is where the spinal cord is going to plug in. We would like you to be able to identify the different types of vertebrae. Uh, note that their difference in appearance reflects their difference in function. So if you're on the top and you're cervical, um, your main function is to be part of the neck, therefore you're more interested in being able to slip past each other. Um, note in particular the ones on the top, the atlas and the axis. Um, we're going to discuss this joint again in the future, but think of how flexible that is as you turn your head. That is precisely two vertebrae turning on each other. Okay. And that, that's a pivot joint, if I get it correct. Um, the functions on the others, um, you'll see better when we have a picture of the vertebrae on here, but the thoracic ones are essentially the ones that are connected to ribs, so they're very structural, um, and the muscles that are going to attach to them are going to be principal, are going to include a function in breathing. Um, as you go lower, the lumbar are very much more important for support and bending, um, so they'll have their own set of attachments for uh, bone processes. Processes are the little fingers that stick out. Um, they'll have their own set of those for a different type of muscular attachment. Finally, there's a bunch of fused bones at the bottom that give you uh, your tailbones. 
and all you have to do is know the name of those. So again, form begets function. Please be able to tell the difference. <clears throat> if we give you an unknown vertebra, you should be able to tell which is which. You can tell by the processes that are attached to them, their styles, how much they stick out. Um, they are all thematically related. They all have um, <clears throat> excuse me, a central cavity for the spinal cord to go through. Um, they have this body here, which is a resting place for the intervertebral discs um, that will cushion um, and essentially establish that joint. Um, try not to throw those out. And those are the three major features. Processes, holes, and a bed to put the vertebral disc on. Here they are out of cartoon. I don't feel the need to elaborate on them any further, but again, be able to identify them uh, just by their appearance. Um, special features of the ribs. Some of them are attached directly, some of them are not. That's noted in your book. Um, you might want to know the difference. Um, but major thing is uh, we're protecting the lungs and the heart, and um, since we're protecting lungs, we have to let the lungs function as well. That means we need a great amount of flexibility. And to achieve that flexibility, we have this high aligned cartilage that's connecting the actual bones of the ribs uh, to the sternum. And again, when we say that some of them are directly connected, these each have their own cartilage, whereas these merge together with their cartilage before they meet up with the sternum. Uh, I think that's it for that. Um, so here, finally, is the, the appropriate figure, right? So the appendicular skeleton is, again, anything that's a limb or anything that's attaching a limb. Um, so again, think if you're a fish, uh, the main axis right here, you don't need any of this other stuff, but if you're going to have a limb, you need a way to attach it to the rest of the skeleton. So that's what things like the scapula are for, um, and the pelvic girdle, and we'll take those apart in detail. Um, again, there's really no re need for me to list everything, but as you start looking at these figures, start thinking about the kinds of joints that are linking things up, and start thinking about how your body um, moves at that one particular place. We'll get you, we'll get this, uh, get you on the details of this in anatomy and physiology more so than here, but you definitely have to know the different styles. So for that, you need one example of each of the different kinds of joints. So if something's linked by a little cushion, like the clavicle to the scapula here, um, or yeah, if there's a separate bone here, you're gonna you're gonna expose my ignorance. But regardless, there's little pieces of cartilage here. That's one kind of joint. Um, we'll point out later uh, up here where the radius meets the ulna. Um, that's another kind of pivot joint. That's a round surface meeting another and moving past the others. Uh, there are planar joints here in the in the carpus, um, so that gives you just a little bit of flexibility as you lift your wrist up, like like I'm showing in class. You can't see, um, but as you flex your wrist, essentially your your phalanges, your fingers, um, with their kind of cone in a hole shape, have a little bit of like conical rotation ability, whereas your thumb, which has a different set. Uh, a different structure really only moves in one one direction, one plane. Um, finally, and I never thought about this before, I actually looked at the different structures of joints. Your elbow, which is a great example of a hinge joint, really, really is locked into one particular plane. You can move your shoulder around just fine, but no matter what, your elbow is always going in that one direction. Um, I may be forgetting one more, but our and we'll come back to those um, joints, but the limbs are a great example of most of them, right? Um, now, these slides come to me pre-manufactured, I have to confess, and why we're spending so much time on the pelvic girdle, I don't exactly know, but you might want to study it a little bit more. Um, I will let it suffice to say that this structure is what's going to embed the femur and give you that highly flexible ball and socket joint 
um, that is your hip. Um, moreover, since we're standing on two legs and we've got a lot of gravity working against us, it has to accommodate a lot of our own unique physiological needs. Um, so there's a large structural component and then there's a large, um, especially in the female, get that huge skull baby out of me structure. Um, and that's better in the next uh, slide where we have male versus female. My wife can tell you that um, having the sacrum and the caustics down here is very relevant to childbirth and if you choose to get um, an epidural make sure you don't push too hard forcing that baby into it or you'll be sore for several years afterward. Um, so um, I think one of the interesting things to think about physiologically is how do you fit an upside down baby into this space? And the actual motion, uh, maybe you can, I don't know if we have a female model in here, um, but we certainly have fetal skulls in here, right? I think that's on purpose. The actual motion is you have to take that skull, make them turn their head sideways, get through, and then turn back. And one of these is upside down in the other way. So not only are on your head, but you're actually nose up at one point, I'm pretty sure. Um, so just doing the kind of 3D Tetris motion there is instructive for one of these major life moments for us. So try to do that in our exercises. Uh, do notice, um, as a converse, um, the male has a lot less space down here uh, because obviously it doesn't have to fill, the, fill that function. Um, but one of the things that lets us do that as well is this um, uh, symphesis. They, uh, this is, is a type of joint here. There's a little bit of cartilage in between these two bones, and that lets the hips actually flex out during childbirth and other <coughs> percussive events. Um, also note that the pelvic bone is one of these that is actually the fusion of many different bones, and you have that wonderful stat in your um, in your manual that says, well, the adult has 206 bones or whatever it is, the baby actually has a lot more because during your you know, postnatal development, you're fusing a lot of these bones together. Again, a lot of slides, I don't know exactly why all of them, but these are the different substructures to the pelvis. Um, take a look. I will take a look at the test and warn you in advance if there's anything that detailed on there. Okay. Um, classification of bones is not sophisticated. It is just a very accurate description. If it's longer than it is wide, it's a long bone. If it's um, flat, then it's a flat bone. Think your skull. Um, if it's essentially a cube, it's a short bone. That's more like a tarsal. Um, and if it really can't describe it, it's an irregular bone. So um, things like the mandible. <clears throat> or the internal bones of the skull shown on this slide. Um, there are two major structures on here. I can guarantee you this will show up. Um, the epiphysis is at the end of a long bone, and the rest of the bone is essentially the diaphysis. So you can think of... Um, excuse me. Um, the reason that that's important, epiphysis is what's actually going to be forming the joint. So this has a cap on it that is made of cartilage to facilitate, well, essentially to lubricate the movement of that joint, um, and also to be a bit spongier than bone itself, um, to make that joint just move past itself easier. Um, there's different characteristics, different densities to the bone as you go down. Uh, eventually, as you get into the main body of the diaphysis, you're going to have the actual uh, storage of bone marrow, which, as you may know, is responsible for generating blood cells. Um, if we get to the end of this and there's not one of these misplaced slides, remind me, we do need to cover the functions of bone, um, which are numerous. Um, number that we'll cover, I believe, is five. Uh, so know those two terms, epiphysis is the end, diaphysis is the middle. Um, if it's a growing bone, there'll be a mesophysis, um, and that's actually one of these kind of cartilaginous joints because it's not actually a, a mature bone itself. 
So as a warm-up round for a game called Challenge, we are going to play a round with a general subject of sushi before moving on to the kinds of joints. So Morgan, who volunteered our um, subject, you will begin speaking. The, the, the timer that won't beep will go off at one minute. I will, one minute, I will stop you. <coughs> Any challenges will stop the clock. Please be animated and argumentative. It makes it more fun. Morgan, start talking randomly about sushi. In one moment. <laughs> Go. Sushi is raw fish and it tastes really, really good. It can also be cooked. It comes with rice and gravy and um, Challenge! <laughs> <laughs> challenge. Something being good is more of a personal opinion. <laughs> I agree. Ali, come to the center. Start talking. Woo! <laughs> Yep. All right, well, it's custom in Oriental countries such as China and Japan. For <laughs> challenge! Shop challenge. That's, that's, that's the, I didn't say it. It's custom. No, it's not. Have you been to China? <laughs> <laughs> I rule that Ali has not been to China, therefore Morgan takes back over. How is that? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say it. I didn't say it. There. It's it's to the center, go. It's the Go. It's the center. Go. In a California world, there could be fake or real crab, and the difference is it's imitation. One is originally organic, and the other one is actual crab. And then it's rice and seaweed and sesame seeds, and you can put like palm tree sauce or a spicy mayo, sesame seed oil, or a spicy Challenge! Oh. I'm bored. <laughs> Talk about something else. <laughs> <laughs> Too specific. Go. 25 left. Means man, please have sushi. <laughs> <laughs> She's not Asian, she doesn't know that. I've been sitting here for a month. Is anyone there with you? Yes, I'm not there. Well, there was a discussion of the Hawaiian ancestry, which puts her closer to the Japanese. But, um, I say Furby hasn't talked yet, so she's up. Let's go. Oh, I can make people stay. It does. Like, I've just bring some sort of vile lecture. Somebody got sick from pucker fish. Shout challenge if you want. Eight seconds. Challenge. Oh, come on. <laughs> Nick, I heard you say challenge. Oh, I want the money to make it. <laughs> Ali doesn't want a challenge. Keep going, Furby. Um, Five seconds. Well, I like to cook fish. <laughs> <laughs> I like You 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 said challenge, but but then Furby kept. So Furby's the winner. What? Candy bar for Furby. Yes. I expect it on Monday. <laughs> Okay, this is the game, except not one of the participants actually said the key word, which is challenge. And we would want you to interrupt. Yeah, Given that the subject is so huge, we'll give this one two minutes. May I please have five, six volunteers to talk about the types of joints? These students, I'm looking at you. Just walk on up. I'm not looking. I'm very expectant. <laughs> Sam, Andrea, Kyle, and I'm there. Michael, <laughs> Get up there. I'm there. I'm the Who else? Emily with a Y. Get up there. This is this is, this is our class's dream team. So, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to say? I'm saying uh, you guys made me pick. So, <laughs> actually, <laughs> our class is pretty kick-ass. To be perfectly honest. Yeah. Are, much kick like, out, <laughs> kick it out. Kick it out. What we just does now. Much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Much like the BCS, certain certain parts of my selections are arguable. Um, unlike the BCS, this isn't rigged. Can we talk about the BCS instead? <laughs> so I think that that is arguable. All right, I saw Andrea hiding, so please be first. Um, two minutes. Go. Okay. Um, you have different joints to give a hinge joint, which is like your thumb, so you 
<laughs> right, Kara's playing to her neck. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, the ball socket joint, which would be like your shoulder. Um, then you have, okay, then you have other kinds of joints, which are, <laughs> so, it's a saddle joint, I know that, that might be somewhere around your hand possibly, like your thumb I think, mm -hmm. you know I don't know where it is, I don't know where it is, it's thumb. I, <laughs> it's a legitimate challenge, but it is factually incorrect. The, south, the thumb is a very good example. It's the only example of a saddle joint. Okay. Um, Restart. Also, 36 down. You also have like a hinge joint in your jaw, in your wrist. Um, you might have like a hinge joint in your wrist. Sam, you going to let that slide? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> then you have the things like, I think like the synovial joint, that I think looks pretty interesting to the Challenge. Okay. Do you have free motion and the other kinds of joints that are based on connections are... No, I, yeah, that's what she said. Yeah. You said might not. Oh, I'm not sure might not. Mm. <laughs> Take over, Sam. You got her on a technicality. Resume, 107 down. Are the joints that are described by how they're connected, they're connected by, however you pronounce it, fluid. The other kinds are... Synovial? Oh. <laughs> the other kinds are cartilaginous and fibrous. The cartilaginous ones are connected by cartilage and they're allowed slight movement. The fibers ones are connected by uh, fibers, and they do not move very much. Uh, the real joints uh, are the ones that move a lot more, like the shoulders and the hips, which are all in the socket. Uh, Cartilaginous joints, <coughs> like your elbows, which are all moved in. Chal I heard a challenge. A challenge that's right? No, that's not right. Oh. You have to tell us why it's not to win control. Because this is your elbows, like they have the rigor and the it's not part of it. True. Okay, you have 13 seconds left to fight for. Now, keep in mind, 13 seconds can go a long way, and there's a candy bar at stake. <laughs> go ahead, Edward. Okay, I don't know, I think it's trying to play the one that was just told me that. Your back, like your right brain, your backbone, you allow like slight movement and then all the way down. Sam erroneously challenges. Five seconds left. Um, I would stress the joints don't move at all, so they'd be like the secret in your brain or like the center of the element. There. <laughs> like sutures in the brain? Yeah. Well done. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> Michael and Kyle, you're fired. <laughs> okay, so I don't know how much of that got picked up by the microphone. I will try to cover all of this completely, though you guys did get about 80-85% of it, and most of it actually correct, so yeah. Um, one thing we'll mention while still on this slide and relevant to that is um, all the different kinds of joints um, where you're talking about ball and socket, or um, ball and chain, or hammer and cycle, and hinge, and all that stuff. That's, those are all different types of synovial. Okay, those are the moving ones. Those are the ones we think of as normal joints. So let's try to fly through this to make sure that you guys have this for posterity. Um, and so I have to look really close at this slide to actually get to this. But remember, there are different ways to characterize them. One is by freedom of movement. One is by how they are connected. Um, and so um, the one that we're going to use less is how they are connected. And those are synovial, which is not particularly connected um, or connected indirectly by tendons, muscles, and so forth. Um, there's cartilaginous and there's fibrous. And um, not discussed in our discussion is the the bony, which is actually a modification of either the cartilaginous or the fibrous. Um, I think we might as well, uh, I guess we'll just come back to those terms, uh, but they are essentially synonymous with some of the other 
descriptions that you'll see, um, and those relate to freedom of movement. So the diarthritic joints are freely movable, and those are the synovial ones, so that's synonymous. The amphiarthrosis, remember the root amphi kind of means in between, means these move just a little bit, and that's therefore the cartilaginous ones, things linked together like uh, your vertebral cushions, um, or in your ankle, there's ligaments that hold um, the tibia and fibula together, something like that. Um, but So they're directly connected by something hard. Um, and finally, there's the ones that don't move at all. Um, synarthritic, synarthrosis. Um, and again, look at the roots there. Syn means all together, like uh, syntony is a word used in phylogenetics. Um, synthesize, put together. Um, that's the root for that. Those are together. Those are the fibrous joints, like the different parts of your bone, fused together via those sutures, uh, originally as cartilage, but ultimately becoming bone later in life. So you have those different classifications. But then, really what we want to discuss is all the different synovial types. And we're just going to run through each of those names and give you an example and talk about their range of movement real quick. Okay. So, a plane joint, also known as a gliding joint, those are synonymous. Um, that's two flat surfaces together, and there's two major examples of this. Uh, the first is in the, we already mentioned, is the wrist bones. So if you flex your wrist, you feel those uh, carpals moving past each other. Okay? That, those are the bones that are moving there, that's that joint. Um, and then the other one is the atlas and the axis, so that's your neck turning. Um, with your head. Um, these aren't in any particular order of flexibility, unfortunately, but um, we do eventually make it to the most flexible down at the bottom. But next is a hinge joint, and really there's only one great example of this, although uh, I think Andrea pointed out one other one that I've already forgotten was in your mandible. Um, this is your elbow. And take a look at those bones in particular where the humerus meets the, the ulna. If there's no way, given the shape of those bones, how they're linked together, much like your Legos do, um, that they would bend in any other direction. Um, I, I'm going to jump here and say that the saddle joint um, kind of provides the same effect. And this is, it's named a saddle because of the way that it, the bone itself is shaped. Um, that's your thumb, and remember it keeps that one primary axis, um, one primary plane. Uh, Okay, others in between here, pivot joints. The best example of this is the pronation and supination of your wrists. So if you turn your hands over right now um, and just do one of them and put your, um, touch your, the bone next to your thumb, that's your radius. As you turn that, you'll notice that you're moving all the way across. So that bone is actually moving over the other. And that joint up here where it meets the humerus is what allows that. And that's a rounded surface tucked up against a slightly concave surface that lets you do that. Again, pay particular attention when you're exploring the bones uh, for that. Um, condyloid joint, again, uh, since we mentioned it before, this is, like, this is your, your actual fingers, your phalanges, uh, in, in their kind of, um, I don't know what, their caves, their nests. Um, but you have essentially a ball mixed in with uh, a more a conical cavity, and that gives you a kind of conical ability to move. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Finally, the most flexible of these, capable of up to 360 degrees of rotation, if not inhibited by ligaments, uh, tendons, and such, is ball and socket. And you already know this. This is your shoulder. This is your hip. Um, and you know that there's a wide range of motion. If only your body wasn't getting in the way, you could actually move your arm pretty much in every direction although there is some limited flexibility going backwards. Again, that's because of the ligaments and the tendons. Um, I think that's the different types. Um, there's still a couple other subjects. We'll move on. Uh, this is further explanation of some of these joints um, and the fancy names for them. Please review these, but I'm not going get, to get it again. Uh, I would stick with these major terms up here, synarthrosis, amphiarthrosis, diarthrosis, diarthrosis, I can't say it, diarthrosis. Um, and remember the, 
the root word to that to help you remember which is which. Sin means all together, amphi means kinda, and die is the other one. Is that a challenge on amphi root? I know it's not ambi. I wish it was ambi, then I'd be totally right. But what's amphi? Amphi is both. Both. Which, Same as, as I was preparing, I meant to make the, the argument of, of an amphibian. You can live on both land, both on water. So it moves a little bit. This is the, the cartilaginous fusions, essentially. Um, there's another example of that down in the pelvis we mentioned before. Okay. Um, again, focus on the, the big terms, but use these as nice examples to, to help illustrate um, what each is for you. Um, we covered these in detail. Um, again, you have the slide for your purposes, but I'm not going to spend more time on it now. Pay particular attention to the structure of the bones as they, um, as they come together. What's that called? Articulate. So the things we'll bust you on are the names of the bones that you are going to be given in isolation and how they articulate. What's the next bone over and what kind of connection is it? Okay, can we handle that matrix? Know what the bone is, know who its neighbor is, and know how, they're, how they come together. Okay, finally is, second to finally, because I'm not going to forget the, the purposes of bone, uh, the anatomy, the histology of bone. So, essentially what you have, um, well first let's correct something. I think of before I learn about it, I think of bone as something stable. It's this hard chunk in the middle of my body, and it's, I develop it, it's there, it sits there, and eventually it decays a little bit when I get older, but there's no real life to it, and that is completely incorrect. The bone is constantly being remodeled. Um, there's osteoclasts, which we're not going to talk about, constantly degrading little areas that have lost their livelihood because they've lost their vasculature. Um, so it actually degrades the bone and lets new living cells, um, for a term we do need to know, which is our osteocytes, the living cells that help secrete extracellular matrix, which then later calcifies to give us our bone. This is a continuous process throughout life. So if you're an osteocyte, which is one of these that's regenerating the bone, you live in uh, one of these little holes, which are called lacuna or lakes, and um, I don't know exactly what we did to get this stain for you, but it illustrates the spaces um, very nicely. Um, anyway, that's where they live. It is vascularized. They have means of communicating with the vasculature um, and with each other. Those means of communication are these small channels called canaliculi. Um, and the main uh, place to find the vasculature is in this Haversian canal. So this is the more major vessels that supplies everything. Vessels do creep out uh, to supply the osteocytes, though. Um, so vasculature is found in the Haversian Canal. That's the big hole in the center. Osteocytes are found in lacunae. Um, they communicate via canaliculi. And the whole circular unit is called an osteon. So this whole chunk here, this bigger structure within the organization of this tissue, is called an osteon, functional unit. Okay, I don't think that there's a separate slide for the functions. Watch me be wrong. Um, but remember, bone is important for lots of things. Uh, it's structure, locomotion. I'm going to forget one, so I need you guys to look in your books and remind me what I'm missing. Um, structure, locomotion, um, protection, um, say in the case of the skull or the ribs. Uh, one of them is uh, generating blood cells. So the bone marrow inside of the long bones, uh, principally the femur, will do, take care of a lot of that. And um, then the one that always surprised me is calcium storage. So your bones um, actually act as a reservoir if your calcium levels get low in your blood. Um, this particularly affects nursing mothers who are constantly sending calcium <coughs> to their children um, and uh, is one of the sources of osteoporosis, uh, which predominantly affects women. Did I miss any in the book? Okay, hopefully that's it after 40 minutes of talking.